This evening I'd like to bring up for reflection a uh, set of uh, dhammas or teachings uh, that the Buddha gave and uh, it was uh, was actually on this last trip to this past week to uh, uh, Jantanisaro's monastery in uh, outside San Diego. It's actually one of the things uh, that he uses in his uh, chanting, evening chanting, and uh, uh, has translated into into English. And it's a uh, um, seven qualities of of uh, respect or reverence and I've uh, chanting it it was it sort of struck a chord with me of how uh, necessary useful important it is when in our practice to have that uh, quality of uh, respect and reverence and to actually they have respect and reverence for the appropriate things, the proper things. Um, otherwise, we tend, otherwise the practice goes all off in uh, various, very strange and uh, unfruitful avenues. So that they, what the... Uh, uh, what the Buddha says are appropriate uh, say fields or avenues of respect or respect for uh, the teacher or the Buddha respect respect for uh, the Dhamma respect for the Sangha respect for Samadhi uh, respect for the training respect for heedfulness and respect for uh, receiving visitors and he says that uh, when these say, conditions are uh, fulfilled then one uh, one's, one doesn't fall away from the practice one doesn't fall away from the training and one it doesn't uh, uh, one stands sort of standing in the presence of Nibbāna, which is a lovely sort of phrase. So that these are I'm just sort of reflecting on the, the quality of, of respect and, and reverence. I think probably one is just to sort of the uh, uh, qualifying uh, what one means by that in that um, 
you know, that which we uh, have reverence for, then we care for it, uh, and care for it enough to also question closely, um, and to investigate it. You know, if we don't have kind of a reverence or respect for something, then we tend not to, uh, say, look at it closely. And this is essential in terms of practice, that we, we have that, the quality of uh, reverence, but we're also looking very closely at it, being very attentive to it. Um, and, you know, for training and, and um, growth in, in the Dhamma, then there needs to be that quality of holding something very closely to the heart, um, being able to allow uh, something to enter into our field of experience and let it be present. Um, you know, otherwise we tend to either reject it out of aversion or dismiss it out of, um, say, just a not really caring for it enough, disinterested, or not having sufficient interest to really bring it into the into the heart. Or if we have desire for something or fascination with out of desire that we're going to get something or be gratified by it, then that's, there's a possession, possessing it and, and trying to possess it, trying to. So that there's an element of self there. But there's so the quality of, of respect in, in uh, uh, the Pali, the word is garawa. Uh, and uh, and it's what uh, say it's part of the uh, the chant on the the highest blessings that we chanted this evening in the the uh, the Parita chanting. So a verse: "Then Karla vocha niwa tocha santu ti cha katanyuta kala inatam masavanang." So. Respectfulness and niwato is of humble ways, of humility, and that's also a, you know they're sort of the you know I think they're they're not there together because of of uh, uh, you know they're, that they're anomalies, right? but they're there together because they complement each other, uh, so that a, a sense of uh, a respectful, reverential attitude towards something needs to rely on, depend on a certain quality of humility and setting aside uh, one's over-exaggerated sense of self, which doesn't necessarily uh, have to display it itself in pride or arrogance, but also in just obsession with ourselves. Uh, even when we're obsessed with how unworthy we are, uh, it's still a kind of a lack of humility. Uh, or if we're obsessed with proving how equal we are, uh, we're just we're still obsessed with self, and the, uh, uh, there's a, uh, a lack of humility. And therefore, are usually uh, as a corollary, one would uh, um, that, qual- that, 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 that attitude of respect and reverence. Uh, it's difficult to shine through because there's so much self involved. There's so much of the the me and the I getting in the way. So to um, you know to be considering that and seeing well how do, how can I uh, you know, bring up an attitude of respect and reverence. And it's important also, they're saying that 
that, you know, respect and and um, respect and reverence, reverence doesn't sort of mean that one's sort of abjectly obsequious, obsequious and groveling. I mean, it means that one has a very healthy uh, attitude and holding of that which is a value and a benefit, and and that's an appropriate response. Um, so that the uh, so it is important to sort of reflect on well, what is you know appropriate to have that quality of reverence towards, and in order that one is able to hold it skillfully, reflect on it, investigate it, uh, so that it it penetrates the heart. Um, So I think, you know, these are aspects that are important to be considering, because that's, you know, particularly for us as Westerners, it doesn't come, usually doesn't come naturally or easily. Uh, And uh, there's a whole lot of of uh, uh, cultural baggage that we carry that uh, uh, tends to obstruct uh, or complicate, not so much obstruct but complicate um, just an attitude of of respect and reverence. Um, So part of it is also just investigating that and reflecting you know, what what's getting complicated, uh, and how do we uh, come back to? Because this this is a very positive quality, uh, which if the if the Buddha says these qualities bring us to a place of um, say stability in Dhamma and standing, sort of in the presence of Nibbana. Uh, there's obviously something uh, extraordinarily wholesome and positive there uh, and balanced. Otherwise, it wouldn't free the heart from suffering. It wouldn't put us in a position of stability and firmness in our practice. So that this, uh, uh, to uh, incline our attention uh, to the quality of heart and the, that and what comes up when we reflect on uh, holding an attitude of of respect and reverence so that the Buddha uses the the the, the quality they say the the Buddha Dhamma Sangha as appropriate objects of of uh, respect and reverence and and that is sort of uh, you know, should be a no-brainer, and as they're um, the, the refuges, these are the sort of the central piece of the of the uh, of the Buddha's teachings. Uh, the Buddha himself emphasized them in many many different ways. Um, also, and say if a, you know, a distinguishing characteristic of of uh, somebody who has entered the entered the stream of of liberation as a a stream enterer uh, is the uh, unshakable faith in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, uh, as well as being uh, firmly established in uh, sila in virtue. So that uh, I mean that makes total sense. Uh, to have that uh, quality of or the, those uh, yeah, the qualities of Buddha Dhamma Sangha and, and there's and of course there's many different ways that one can uh, reflect on uh, the Buddha Dhamma Sangha as refuge uh, both in an external way and an internal way and I've talked about that in, in you know many uh, different uh, different ways and instru- at, uh, times of instruction. But also having 
uh, say, respect for samadhi, uh, realizing that the uh, the mind really needs to be trained. The heart really needs to be firmly established. Uh, when the mind uh, is not well trained, when it's not settled, when it's not uh, one-pointed, uh, it gets itself into lots and lots of trouble. And that's uh, and one reflects on that and sees that you should really see. God, yeah, this cultivation of samadhi, the firm establishing of the mind, is a something that is really worthy of respect and revering, holding it up as important. Uh, not in a theoretical, abstract way of, you know, when I get the fourth jhana down, then I'll be happy, or if I get even the the formless jhana is down, then it'll be all it'll all be fine. Uh, but uh, recognizing uh, how necessary uh, the quality of stillness, firmness, uh, one pointedness is to the fundamental health of the of the mind, of the heart. So that that uh, um, lays the foundation for us to really put forth effort in our training, in our practice, to uh, incline uh, our hearts to uh, stilling the mind rather than uh, getting lost in uh, endless complications, proliferations, speculations uh, that uh, are, uh, you know, which can be maybe uh, have some grounding in Dhamma, but uh, there's not the, the quality of stillness there, stability. So that the uh, having respect for the <coughs> samadhi that the the Buddha encouraged over and over again the developing of uh, of stillness uh, of samadhi <coughs> and that. Uh, so it really is a, an essential piece of if we're ever going to see something clearly, understand something fully, we have to ex- experience it, see it with a uh, a heart of uh, that isn't restless, wavering, uh, needs to be still. The other thing that, and that the Buddha encouraged, talked about, was the, or in this series, was the respect for training, sikha. And realizing, again, similar to this, to say that, you know, the, the need for the stillness of mind, the need for training, uh, the need for developing the path, the need for cultivating wholesome qualities, the need for relinquishing unwholesome qualities. You know, on a certain level, our intelligence can sort of figure out that, uh, you know, and there are teachings that talk about, you know, you know, there's, you know, you don't need to do anything, you don't need to 
strive too hard. If you're just striving too hard, then you're it's all just sort of self-centered and and uh, goal-oriented and uh, missing the point and and you know there's a certain amount of, there's a certain element of truth there, but it's like Ajahn Cha would say. Uh, yeah, it's true, but it's not right. Or it's right, but it's not true. So that the there is a uh, a need to recognize uh, where we're lacking, uh, where we're. Uh, sort of missing, where we're still uh, not able to, uh, say, to let go, we're not able to uh, bring forth the qualities of wholesomeness, of, of, of relinquishment, of uh, sort of compassion, uh, of wisdom, and uh, I realize that we you know, we need to train, we need to uh, cultivate, we need to uh, put forth uh, an appropriate effort uh, that will uh, give us the the uh, kind of the kind of the momentum of training and practice uh, that is. Uh, uh, Say enough to uh, allow us to to say to let go to uh, abide in uh, non-attachment to uh, to uh, and even in uh, on the basic level of just to be restrained. I mean, it's so easy for people to to uh, talk about. Very high elements of of non-attachment and emptiness, but you know, not be able to keep the precepts, or not be able to uh, just restrain oneself from uh, kind of restless activity that is is uh, is not really essential to dhamma practice, uh, or to restrain oneself from being, uh, you know, just lazy, mm. not putting forth the appropriate effort. So this kind of respect for training, realizing that you know, there's uh, uh, the need for uh, for for training. And any training is going to take take some sort of take some sort of effort, uh, a willingness to to uh, uh, and to put forth effort in in practice, put forth effort in one's life uh, toward that which is in accord with dhamma. We usually don't need to encourage ourselves to. Get the effort to do to do things that aren't aren't really in line with dhamma. That sort of comes fairly easily, but that the 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 path is really one of uh, bringing forth the effort to and to sustain it in that which is really in accord with dhamma. So that respect and reverence for training. Respect and, and reverence for heedfulness. Uh, in Pali, is apamada, and uh, uh, apamada is. Uh, I mean, it's a hard term to translate. Heedfulness is uh, uh, sort of right. Uh, 
but it doesn't really, to me, heedfulness doesn't really have much meaning in English. Um, there's a sense of care, caution, um, say attentiveness to what is true. Uh, And uh, so that to be, you know, to have this circumspection is maybe is a is a good word. And to be very circumspect and and uh, attentive to to what is uh, what's right, what's true, what's appropriate. And the Buddha, you know, places a, a very high. Uh, value on that, saying that the, say, apamada, this heedfulness, is the path to the deathless. Mm-hmm. And it is, if we're truly going to experience the, the kind of the, the ultimate fruits of, of, of the Buddhist teachings and to uh, they truly liberate the heart. Uh, there needs to be this very, very circumspect, attentive uh, quality of of mind. The mind needs to be very, very careful, uh, not heedless, not careless, not. Uh, so that there's this uh, lovely balance of mind which is is really very attentive. And so that's what the Buddha said, this is the path into the deathless. And when the Buddha Uh, you know, he, uh, at the end of his life, after he'd taught for 45 years, elucidated sort of four noble truths, eightfold path, seven factors of enlightenment, uh, dependent origination, extraordinary uh, subtleties of philosophical uh, perspectives of of viewing the self, viewing the world, uh, viewing the path to liberation, uh, when at the end of his life, when he sort of summarized the whole teachings, uh, basically just sort of said they, that they uh, say all things are subject to dissolution, establish yourself in heedfulness, in circumspection in Appamada, in sort of his last, wor- last words, in Vahaya Dhamma Sankara Appamadena Sampadeta. So, so this quality of Appamada is, encompasses the whole path, encompasses the whole teaching, and how we can train. So having this quality of respect and reverence, holding it dearly, uh, appreciating its importance. These are ways of talking about this this quality of karlawa to to respect. Because it's not just sort of a um, blind respect, put it up on a a pedestal, worship it, bow to it. Uh, If we're going to truly respect something, we need to bring it into our daily life. We truly need to use it in our cultivation. Uh, If we're not using it, if we're not applying it, if we're not living it, you know, that that isn't really truly revering it, respecting it in its appropriate way. Uh, To really, from the Buddha's perspective, you know, to really have respect and reverence for something, one needs, has to live it, one has to really be it, uh, bring it into, into one's, one's being. 
And it's interesting, the last uh, quality that the Buddha uh, talks about um, in Pali is Patisantara. Uh, and it's translated as receiving, uh, receiving guests. Um, and and sometimes you wonder why you know why is it usually the Buddha would say give if he was going to give a a sequence it would be uh, in a uh, say it would usually be in a, in some sort of order uh, and the uh, uh, these qualities are are you know seem to be in a um, say in an, a, a, an ascending order of uh, how a kind of progression of development of importance, and then there's this uh, receiving guests at the end, and how you know how does that work? But I think. Uh, Similarly, in terms of what I was just saying, of, of the, you know, bringing this, these qualities of, of reverence into our life, um, you know, if we have respect for Buddha Dhamma Sangha, we have the respect for um, stillness of mind, training, uh, heedfulness, then it applies itself in how we relate to others. How we relate to the uh, people around us. Uh, and, you know, looking after people, caring for people. Um, and because there's usually a, a tendency in the mind to sort of get, again, sort of the, the obsession with ourselves, our little world, our little uh, kind of little bubble that I'm comfortable with. Uh, my security is is very settled in this little sphere, uh, and not be willing to um, be attentive, to be caring, to uh, look after others, uh, so that the. Um, you know, and you can see the mind, especially when one is practicing. Sometimes the, uh, or it doesn't have to doesn't necessarily have to be practicing, but, um, but one can see somehow where one doesn't want to deal with something that is new or different. One wants to keep it all very familiar, so that one is not challenged or or upset or irritated or aggravated or stretched in any way. Uh, so that this uh, receiving guests uh, to actually extend oneself to uh, be uh, receiving others in a, a way that is uh, kind, compassionate, Caring, so it's actually re- actually living the, the the qualities of loving kindness and compassion. Uh, it's one thing to sort of sit in meditation and sort of think thoughts of loving kindness and compassion, but to actually have to do it with real people—that's really uh, sort of revolutionary. Uh, so to um, to recognize that. Uh, the the kind of reverence for uh, looking after others is a way of uh, you know it's, just, it's a quality of mind that is important for uh, a balancing the, the these um, the aspects of our life uh, so that we're we're able to to uh, uh, 
Yeah, so that the heart opens. So that the 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 quality of mind is appropriate, is ready uh, to uh, enter into and abide in Dhamma. Because to you know, if Dhamma isn't challenging us in some way, uh, then we're you know, we're usually uh, say say not uh, stepping forward to the to the uh, to the practice. So that to to look at these different areas of of respect and reverence, and then to see how one can. Uh, utilize them for uh, bringing ourselves forward to the to the Dhamma, uh, to really allowing uh, uh, Dhamma to to uh, really uh, inform our practice and our life, and particularly in terms of of meditation practice um, I really take the time and say this evening I mean this is uh, the the all night sit we've got time for sitting meditation walking meditation take those qualities and really start to allow it to settle uh, with uh, uh, that that sense of reverence respect um, both in terms of the the being attentive to the object of meditation, uh, cultivating the samadhi aspect, and then the investigating of what is what is it that obstructs us from entering into dhamma. What is it that where we hold back? Where do we hold back? And how can that quality of reverence allow the mind to come forward and embrace? Dhamma in a in a skillful way. Uh, where is it that we we're, we're sort of overreaching? Where we're seeking something, uh, some personal gain, some personal sense of what we think we should be doing, some you know idea and opinion of what we think uh, you know we sh- we should be doing, we should be, and that sort of overreaching. And then that quality of uh, of reverence for these different qualities. How to balance that so that there's this sense of being present for the Dhamma and then allowing, uh, say, Dhamma to uh, say to work on us rather than us, me, getting my practice together on my terms. Um, and there's that, I think that's that sort of a fundamental uh, problem that comes with you know, this like me trying to get my practice together and, and trying to figure it out on my terms or whatever. And that, and and there's it's sort of those qualities of setting uh, like setting all that aside and just bringing up a sense of respect, the reverence, appropriate holding with care towards the Buddha, towards Dhamma, towards Sangha, towards Samadhi, towards the training, towards heedfulness and towards the uh, re, say receiving guests in the way of... Uh, so that taking that as a, as a way of uh, reflecting on our attitude, how we're holding the meditation object, how we're holding our attitude to practice, and then uh, allowing that quality of respect or reverence to transform so that it's uh, transform the practice so that it's sort of the Dhamma uh, is what is uh, sort of almost doing its Practice on us, uh, rather rather than sort of me 
mm-hmm. getting you know my practice together. So I'll offer that for investigation this evening. Andamayana varakataya sadhu karam dadamase.